of thinking about cognition within the pandemic, one of the things that we know that's really, really important is cognitive stimulation. So keeping brains active, keeping people occupied. And there are lifestyle factors that can moderate the level of difficulty people might have. So we know that being physically active is important. We know that being socially connected is important. Um, and having kind of meaningful activity to take part in. Obviously, people have not been able to have those same opportunities during lockdown. There's been a large proportion of people with cognitive impairments that have been socially isolated or living alone. So not having the opportunities to have conversations, to engage in activities in the same way, I think has been really, really difficult in terms of maintaining the same level of cognitive stimulation. I would think about sort of cognition would be around those those skills of sort of learning socializing thinking problem solving and I guess that comes into all of my work you know at every age with young people but it is about being aware of um, where they're at in terms of the developmental stage of what sort of cognition you're going to be seeing so obviously the thinking skills you're expecting from a five six year old are going to be very different from the thinking skills you're going to be expecting from a 15 16 year old and that transition through those times is obviously something we have to be really aware of in terms of how we work Many people talk about experiencing, you know, lack of motivation, brain fog uh, uh, as a result of, possibly as a result of losing all their routines um, uh, in their day, uh, getting up at a regular time, doing this, the same things every day. I think maybe uh, beforehand we didn't realise how how much that contributed actually to sort of you know clear thinking and, and mental stabilities. I think when you go younger down the age group actually in some ways it got harder because there were a lot of young people who weren't already on screen a lot who weren't already they may have been texting friends but they weren't interacting with their friends in a social way um, via screen or via social media. And once you got down to the really little ones, so my, my daughter, my youngest is six, and it was really evident for her that screen just didn't really add up. You know, she, she knew what it was, she chatted to people on the screen before, but that was not interacting with people. That, would, that didn't count as socialising. The, the impact of the pandemic on the young person's uh, learning, on the, um, the sort of any attainment gap that may be there, uh, being able to uh, give advice to the school or the parent about how that young person can best be integrated back into school. Uh, we are having to really evaluate that on a case-by-case -case basis. Cognitive processing is, is extremely complex. Um, and as people age naturally those cognitive processes do slow um, because our brain is part of our body which is wearing out so it's bound to happen um, one of the things i have noticed in the pandemic um, is that increase in in delirium with people who have had covid now i don't know why that is um, i'm not a neuro scientist or <laughs> psychiatrist but um, the impact it's had on people being able to do what they need to do is huge. One of the areas that I think we need to be considering is about how we support people with long COVID or um, individuals that may have experienced COVID themselves. So thinking about the effects of having COVID, the fact that people might have been in intensive care, that they may, may have had mechanical ventilation, they may have had um, medication, thinking about the possible side effects of that. Especially with older people, um, cognitive impairments is very, very common. It doesn't necessarily have to be a diagnosed dementia, but actually through those ageing processes and even as much as um, small vessel disease in the brain um, and just general brain atrophy that comes from ageing, cognitive processes are affected. So I think it's 
really important that it should be um, on the radar in, in those, the NHS five year plan and the long term plans. We're going to need to find new solutions. We're going to need to find ways of accelerating uh, our solutions to those to those problems. I think as NHS professionals, it's really important to think about the wider context of the NHS and the social and political climate as well. Um, with the NHS long-term plan, I guess the key aims of that are encouraging services to think about um, the start that people have in their lives so thinking about mother and child services another aim is trying to think about try um, the links between mental health and physical health now we're hopefully coming through that survival period um, and we're starting to look to the future we don't know what the landscape is going to be yet so it's it's very difficult to to make plans uh, currently. I mean, obviously the challenges within the NHS, I mean, they are the similar challenges that are to, to education. I mean, it's the sort of postcode lottery of services and the bottlenecks. I mean, these, I think, are problems that have been hugely exacerbated uh, by the pandemic. So I guess those problems are going to be probably larger than they were. I guess for me, one of the things that I really like about the NHS is um, about that long term plan at the moment is the focus on joining up, on um, wanting to make sure that it's networks, supportive networks around young people and around anyone um, struggling with a mental health issue. And that we're trying to get away from sort of things in, in little in little silos, in little groups where they don't connect, where mental health is seen as completely separate from other forms of health, where education is different from other, you know, other areas of welfare. I've had some really lovely examples in my own practice in the last few months where that actual contact and communication with the community mental health team has been really, really valuable in making that person's um, transfer home from hospital um, really seamless and, and keeping hold of the fact that their mental health is a massive part of, of the problems that they've been having which brought them into hospital in the first place. Um, so yeah, that, that relationship between, between the two is really, really important and definitely something which can be worked on in the future. It's not just about that one hour of cognitive rehab that they have with a specialist, but actually how do we take those strategies and transfer them into somebody's daily routine? Is there a way that carers and family members can also support individuals, be that particular strategies, activities, ways that questions are asked, um, thinking about where things might be in the environment, um, so yeah, I, I, I think we are making progress, but I think that next stage would be really, really important.